Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting in 2018 of the Health and Sports Committee. Uh, can I uh, ask everyone in the room to please switch off mobiles or switch to silent? And while you're very welcome to use uh, social media and devices for uh, doing social media, please don't record or film the proceedings as that is being done for us uh, and is readily accessible. Uh, I have apologies this morning from Sandra White uh, and uh, I would uh, uh, welcome all our witnesses to the roundtable session uh, we have. Before, uh, before asking everyone round the table to introduce themselves, just to put on the record that prior to this session, members of the committee visited and met with young people in Edinburgh, in Glasgow and in Elgin, and uh, the feedback from those young people will form part of the information uh, that uh, members are aware of in asking you questions this morning. Uh, we also met with a group of young people here in the Parliament and at colleges in, in Glasgow uh, and in Elgin. And I would like on behalf of the committee to thank all of those who contributed to that, the young people who attended and, and shared their views with us, uh, and those who helped to organise uh, those events. And as I say, what we heard then will form the basis of our discussion today. Can I ask uh, witnesses to simply to note, in terms of the technology, there is no need to touch the buttons on the consoles in front of you. Uh, all the recording is automatic, and as I say, everything that you say will be recorded uh, and be part of the official record of the meeting. So. What I would propose to do is introduce myself and, and then go round the table and ask all of those members and witnesses uh, this morning to introduce themselves. My name is Lewis MacDonald. I'm the convener of the Health and Sport Committee and a member of Parliament from North East Scotland. Good morning. My name is Ash Denham. I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Eastern and I'm the deputy convener. Hi, I'm Sandra McDougall. I'm acting director with the Scottish Health Council, which is part of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I'm here representing Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Good morning. I'm Miles Briggs. I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian Region, and I'm Conservative spokesman for Health and Sport. Hi, I'm Alice Ferguson. I'm representing SYP, the Scottish Youth Parliament. I'm a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for the Linlithgow constituency and newly elected convener of the Health and Wellbeing Committee at SYP. Morning everyone, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton Lib Dem, MSP for Edinburgh Weston and Party Health Spokesperson. Good morning, I'm Denisha Kylo. Um, I'd just like to take a bit of a moment just to introduce myself. Um, I'm here representing today Who Cares Scotland as a care experience sports person. I'm 19, I'm a student at Strathclyde University. Just a bit of context to my background, I was taken to care as a baby. I was then adopted when I was four and as a young adult my circumstances changed, I was put into care again. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Who Care Scotland and our 2,000 members to ensure that care experience people are given a lifetime of equality, respect and love they deserve. I'm Kate Forbes and I'm an M MSP for Sky, Lochaber and Badenoch. Good morning everybody, I'm Emma Harper, I'm MSP for South Scotland Region. Good morning, my name is Amy Woodhouse and I am the Head of Policy Projects and Participation for Children in Scotland. Morning, Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Good morning, I'm Julie O'Donnell, Head of uh, Learning and Development for Love Learning Scotland, but here today representing the Scottish Children's Services Coalition. Uh, good morning, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Good morning everyone, I'm Ailsa Wiley, Lead Manager in the School and Community Team at Sports Scotland. Good morning, I'm Brian Whittle, I'm South of Scotland, uh, MSP and, and Conservative Party Spokesperson on Health, Education, Lifestyle and Sport. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Nikki. I'm from Bernardo, Scotland, and I'm the policy lead for mental health and wellbeing. Thank you very much. And we have one a vacant seat at the moment, but I expect our colleague David Stewart uh, to join us uh, in the course of proceedings. Uh, can I start off by reflecting on some of the evidence we heard in the course of our visits out and about? Uh, and, and some of that was around how far young people's views and experiences were heard and taken into account by uh, within the health services, whether in primary care, in secondary care, or in, in policy terms. And I wonder if the witnesses would like to uh, offer a, a view on that. Uh, do, do you believe that the views of young people are taken into account and, and heard by people making policy? And do you believe that uh, more uh, needs to be done in order to ensure that those views are acted upon? Who would like to kick off on, on that question? 
it's a, it's a, it's a very general question, so uh, feel free to contribute from whatever angle you wish. Yes, Al. Um, doing our consultation prior to this uh, meeting today we got back that people feel that they don't know where they stand in terms of young people that aren't hearing how their uh, views are being heard in, in in parliament however the likes of this today is definitely something that should be done more often not just for year of the young people and um, more sort of workshops and um, young people sitting in on meetings like this, that shouldn't just be for Year of the Young People. Year of the Young People should be the starting point, provide a framework, and then it should continue for uh, the years to come. Excellent. Thank you very much. Who else would like to... Yes, Amy. Just uh, back up what Alice said there and, and, and agree, I think, in recent years. We've definitely seen an improvement in the recognition that it's important to involve children and young people in all aspects of their lives. Obviously, um, uh, the UK government has is, is ratified the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of the Child. and We have that within uh, the, the Children and Young People's Scotland Act, although we've not got it fully incorporated into Scots law yet, and that's definitely something that we're, we're hoping will will progress um, um, but within that obviously all public services have a duty to um, uh, recognise um, the impact of their services on children's rights and one of those rights article 12 states that um, children have a right to be listened to on matters that affect them and for their views to be taken seriously so we have that duty there now um, and the extent to which it is um, embedded meaningfully within how public services and within how health services are delivered, I, th I think we would all agree varies considerably and we've all witnessed quite good practice in certain areas. Um, um, but still, um, I think probably us in the sector would, who, do, who do this work, who engage with children and young people to inform policy making, would see that it is still patchy, it is still um, sometimes tokenistic. Um, and the extent to which it actually influences and changes policy, I think, is still probably questionable. Um, and that's maybe because we just don't know. Sometimes it may well do. Sometimes when um, SYP or Bernardos or whoever have engaged with children and young people, what they say is taken on board within the mental health strategy or what have you. Sometimes we just don't know what difference it's made. And I think that's possibly part of the area where there's still a lot to be done around the feedback loop. Sorry, I'll go on. <laughs> no, that's, that's very helpful. Sandra? Yeah, um, we commissioned a scoping study uh, about a year and a half ago, which uh, engaged with organisations representing children and young people's interests and, and with young people themselves to find out how involved they felt um, in relation to health and, and social care services. Um, young people who responded to the survey said that they thought it was, it was right that they should be involved, but they weren't always uh, feeling that their voices were uh, being heard. They weren't always being being asked or, or feeling that they were, were being listened to. Um, I think that said, we, we heard lots of examples of really good work that was happening across Scotland to, to involve people. But um, what we also found was that um, there wasn't a lot of published evidence really about um, the best ways of, of involving people and, and um, also of the impact, just picking up on, on Amy's point, about the impact uh, of, of their views being heard when they are being involved. So we think that's probably an area that, that needs to be strengthened. Um, I think often when engagement happens, you'll have a, a report which says, here's what young people told us. It's the follow-up to that in terms of, well, and what then happens as a result of that, that I think is sometimes a bit lacking. I think when um, engagement has been planned, it's really important that people are thinking about short-term impact as well as medium and longer term, how to, to evidence that and how to make sure that that's fed back to the, the individuals who are being engaged. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what everyone's already said in terms of there's lots of um, progress been made in terms of um, taking into account children and young people's views at a sort of national level. Um, as Amy mentioned, a couple of initiatives around the mental health strategy led by SYP and lots of other um, really good organisations. But I think from our point of view, when we sort of asked young people in terms of mental health around um, how their views are taken into account, there was a lot of discussion around not being taken seriously. And when young people, what they see in terms of whether their views are being heard are specifically sort of around the services that they access on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not necessarily a piece of legislation that's been changed or something like that. It's can I access that service when I need it and am I taken seriously? And so that kind of micro kind of um, level 
type um, involvement. So that's probably where there needs to be a bit more. Kind of Thanks, Nikki. Um, okay. Um, I, 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 would anyone like to offer a, a, a good example of where Scottish government or public, local government or public bodies have engaged with young people and, and, and provided feedback on on, 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 a, on a response. Is there any? Uh, yes, Elsa. So, from a sports welcome point of view, um, we've been working in partnership um, with Young Scott um, over the last uh, a number of years to have a young people sports panel, and that's a representation from across um, quite a diverse range of young people who will come and sit and consult and influence um, around sport and physical activity agenda. Um, where an example of this where um, that's actually been taken forward was um, around a Scottish Government report in um, giving children and young people um, access and that then was formed part of the Scottish Government's youth sports strategy document. Um, so that was definitely in terms of engagement, uh, listening. Um, that's the kind of thing that then will happen uh, with the Young People's Sports Panel. They're involved um, right across everything in terms of consultation from Sports Scotland's in-house stuff, but also with a lot of work with our partners. And what we're now finding is that a lot of partners, Scottish government bodies and local authorities are now creating their own um, Young People's Sports Panels so that this is actually then influencing on the ground as well and local as well. So we're seeing quite a lot of movement there. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, can I now hand over to Ash then? Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to ask this morning about care experienced young people. Um, so obviously the local authorities act as the corporate parent for health and wellbeing issues. So I'd like to ask how well you think that's working. Um, but more widely than that, what more could be done in order to make sure that the views of care experienced young people are taken to, into account for a policy development um, at the local level, but also at the national level as well? In terms of care experience, people, we are a hidden group in society. There's not a lot of research around us. We are kind of a minority in that sense. We're, when we are talked about, it's from a, protect, like, a, like a policy sort of viewpoint, not the actual experience. So when it comes to local authorities, we do have a lot around it. Obviously, corporate parents is a big thing that's coming in right now. And there has been a, like, a lot of improvements that have been done, for example, with in terms of sport. We have some local authorities giving out free membership passes to allow care experience people to access that. But the fact of the matter is, I think personally from my experience, my local authority did fail me, and I'll just tell you a bit of, about that. So I was adopted at four, and then the state kind of obviously made the decision when I was adopted that they stopped being involved in my life, which was fair enough. I was raised in a very nice adoption, but that broke down very quickly. My mum and dad got divorced when I was seven, and then when I was 14, my mum died. And I was sort of in this way where my whole experience of adoption, it went from secure to have nothing, and local authority never came and checked who was looking after me. It was very lucky that I was put into kinship care with my brother and sister, but that was informal. No support was given to them. And I feel like a lot of our members do feel like that. We've had, only three years ago, we changed our constitution at Who Cares Scotland to include adoption as part of that, because it, it's just unfortunate that too many times it's happening to people who are adopted that one day their adoption breaks down and there's nobody there to look after it. And I feel like although a lot of progress has been made, there's just not enough. And local authorities need to do more to look at every aspect of care and not just decide one day that they can stop being a parent. Thank you very much. Are there other views from witnesses on, on, on that question? I know there are a couple of members with, with other questions to ask, but are there other views from witnesses? Yes, Amy. Um, on a local level, um, I recognise Denisha's experience. Um, there are, in several areas, champions boards, um, which offers a good opportunity for local care experienced um, young people to meet with local authorities and identify the priorities um, in their areas and hopefully make action to improve the lives um, of, of care experienced young people. In, in areas, and we also have a number of, of national opportunities, obviously, at the moment, with the Care Review um, offering the, the best opportunity to listen to children and young people's voices. Um, and um, that, 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 that feels really young person led, actually. I have to say, that feels qualitatively different from um, some other the reviews that have happened. And, and, and is, is it a, you know, a, an emerging stage? But is, 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 is we're really hopeful um, that that's going to actually um, really change things for care experienced young people. Okay, thank you very much. Ivan. 
Yeah, thanks, convener. And it's just on the specific point, um, the, uh, the in connection with care experience, young people, the value of mentoring. Um, now, I volunteer with MCR Pathways in Glasgow, who uh, mentor care experience young people, and the plan is to roll out throughout Scotland. And certainly, the data suggests, in terms of positive outcomes, it has a very positive impact. I was just wanting to get anyone's um, impressions. Were you aware of mentoring programmes like that? And what kind of value do you see there? Is it something you think makes um, add some value to the young person's life? Denisha. Yeah, I feel like that's incredibly essential, as was mentioned by Amy. The care of you is an incredible opportunity, and mentoring, of course, is a great thing. But the fact of the matter is, it's just not happening enough, which I think everyone can accept. On the issue, again, of corporate parenting, it's a fantastic thing. But when we asked our members, actually 70% of Kate Spence young people did not know what a corporate parent was. And these are people supposed to be changing our lives. And furthermore to that, the amount of people who did know what a corporate parent was, 80% of them knew what it was like by Who Cares Scotland. And I just think, although progress has been made and we are going in the right place, there's just not enough being done. I have Alex Go Hamilton. Thank you very much, Kamina. Good morning to the panel. Um, I should start by reminding members of my interests that I worked for uh, eight years with Abelaro, which is a major residential care provider. Also worked with Who Cares and Bernardo's in terms of influencing the passage of the Children and Young People Act. And when we were doing that, um, it was clear that this idea of the corporate parent does not apply in the same way the responsibilities of a birth parent would. You know, the, you would imagine, for example, take for example, um, when you are a birth parent. If your um, son or daughter were to die prematurely, first of all, you would want to know about that. And second of all, you would not want to know why. Whereas um, up until the passage of that bill, there was no um, rule in law which said that Scottish ministers, who are the ultimate corporate parent in looking after uh, children and young people, um, should even be made aware when a, a young person who had care experience died prematurely. And we know that they are far more likely to die prematurely because of the range of neg negative social outcomes that they have. Do you think we need something uh, like they have in, uh, for example, the Capital Territory of Australia? We met with some politicians from them last week who have uh, care support teams which follow care experienced young people from their departure from the care system right through the rest of their life that they can always touch base with and receive extra support if needs be. Denisha? Uh, I can only speak from my personal experience and what you mentioned there I think would have really helped my situation. I feel like that is something that's really incredibly essential to ensure that we don't just one day forget about people in our care, because at the end of the day, Scotland's supposed to be the best place for a child to grow up. So we do need to ensure that it is, and that when there is situations where there's cracks, we'd fix them. Thank you very much. Uh, Nikki. I'm not aware of the specific um, Australian example that you gave, Alex, but um, I think in terms of what you're saying about the, the relationship across the life course for a young person in care, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the crucial points that comes up all the time is that it's that disconnect between going between different, having to go between different professionals and different services that is, is part of the, the problem. So yeah, I would, yeah. Very, very briefly from Alex. Very briefly. Um, one of the big achievements in that bill, obviously, it was a cross-party uh, success of extending the age of leaving care um, to 21 in Scotland, which is seen as world-leading. Um, but one of the problems with that, we don't have a right for care leavers to return, so that many young people may decide at 16 that they're old enough to, to strike out on their own and realise very soon after that they've made a mistake. Do you think that's something we need to change in Scotland? Do you think we should have a right for care leavers to return to care if they're still under 21? Does anyone have a view on that? If not, you can think about it and come back to it. Um, uh, Denisha, yes, please. Uh, yeah, well, I feel like that's kind of a similar situation to me. Like, I just, what you were saying exactly, also they might choose to leave. The two men, it was just, unfortunately, so many people do think that leaving care is the best thing. So many of our members think that the care they are in is so bad that they can't imagine anything better than leaving. But when they do leave, they realise they've got no support. They don't have that safety net. And it's about making care so good that people don't want to see being no having nothing is better than having care. When we should look after them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson. Um, just picking up on that point, Denisha, I was a corporate parent um, when I was a councillor in Edinburgh and I will never forget watching this film that care experienced young people had made. There was four of them. They were absolutely desperate to leave residential accommodation and then it followed their story into having their own flats and the huge challenges that that, that 
you know, it, it was just incredible. They were so young and they were, they were on their own. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that you are here this morning. What I'd like to ask is, to what extent do you feel that care-experienced young people are able to achieve their ambitions without parental support? And you touched earlier on the fact that some local authorities have given free access to leisure centres and so on. I know that was something we discussed in Edinburgh. But, you know, it's one thing to get free access to a leisure centre. It's another thing to have someone that will take you there four or five times a week if you want to pursue something seriously. You know, how is that impacted by, by being in care? Yeah. So, just on that point, I do think that care experience people are like any other kid. They are talented, they are ambitious, they are determined, but there is barriers to access in that. So, what you said about just touch on the membership, just like sport. So... When I was younger, I was really into football. I loved it. I loved beating the boys at football. It gave me so much ambition. And then when it was that decision when you went to secondary school and boys and girls were split, it was then there was not a local girls' football team. My local girls' football team was half an hour, 40 minutes away. Having a mum who was a full-time foster carer couldn't just up and drive me places. It wasn't accessible for me to continue my love for sport. And on the wider picture of that with care experienced kids, that is what is happening. The kids can't just get access to these things. If you're in a residential unit, people aren't see, people you're looking after you in the residential unit aren't going to say, "Oh, if you've got football training at six, but dinner's at six thirty, we can't stop dinner times for you to go and play football." There's institutional constraints like that that are stopping children from getting access to it. And also, some of our members over the space of a few years have up to ten different bedrooms. The reality is. Children are being moved from placement to placement, from school to school, and they are missing out on valuable time like that. If you miss all that time, you're going to not have the same opportunities as another kid. And that is hindering us in our lives because we feel like we are falling behind and there's no one there to pick us back up. Thank you very much. Alice? that part of SYP's policy which is developed and voted on um, by young people is that children and young people growing up in Scotland's care system that they are just what you're saying and um, that greater risk of poor mental health outcomes because of um, feeling left out and that the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland should uh, work with relevant organisations to ensure that the needs of these young people are being met with accessible, sustainable and high quality mental health services. And this passed um, with 98% of the membership vote. So it's a very um, strong... Absolutely. Uh, Brian. I think, thank you, Camille. I just wanted to point out that uh, I think one of the things we should be connecting off is, is good practice. Um, I'm really, I coach a young lad who um, is in residential care, um, and they, that care home bring him to training every single uh, every single training session with some other uh, uh, sort of learning dif the difficulties uh, individuals. And in fact, I'm just going to say he's going to the European Championships next month. Okay, um, any US Championships? Um, but uh, I think I, I was just going to ask the question: Are we cognizant enough of what good practice is and what's what's ha what the good things that are happening out there, and, what, and are we learning from that? Or should we be be more uh, be more aware of that? Anyone want to come back, Matt? Nikki, I know you were coming back on a slightly different question, but slightly different. It is slightly. Different. <laughs> Ilsa, is that one you could address in terms of? Good practice and bad practice in sports. And yeah, I mean, I, I would agree, just sitting listening um, to personal story there from Denisha, um, you can't argue with somebody sitting in the room, you know, and I think there's definitely always more um, that can be done for young, our young people. Um, we do know that local authorities, Leisure Trust, they are out there trying to make things as accessible as possible, um, and I think we just have to keep working with them um, to try and get more... In terms of good practice, I can't think of anything um, off the top of my head in terms of young people from care experience and backgrounds, but that's something I'll definitely try and find out more about. Um, but I really think it's about us listening and working with young people so that we can actually find out what the solutions are and what would work with them, because we definitely don't want to exclude. And we've heard from you know someone um, from a care background this morning, but I think there's other barriers that are you know, out there that exist that provide the same problems as Denisha has um, articulated. So we definitely need to keep working in that area. Okay, thank you very much. And I know we'll come back to some of these questions uh, later in the morning uh, in, in, from a slightly different angle. Can I move on now to the question of access to healthcare? Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. 
Um, my question is whether there are specific issues, in your opinion, which impact on the ability of young people to access both healthcare services and healthcare information, how this could be addressed. And that comes out of a number of um, fact-finding visits that we had in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Elgin that were flagged by young people there. Whatever the issue, the, the difficulties in knowing where to go to get help um, and the information available. Who would like to start on that? Yes, Julie. Um, I think one of the things we found um, just through kind of discussions on our, our daily working with some of our young people, um, I think a lot of the time they feel overwhelmed by um, the kind of language used and it's, it's not relatable in terms of maybe some of the campaigns that are put out, that it's not young person centred enough. Um, I know there has, there's been masses of work done in terms of that, but I think that's something that comes up against um, when we will maybe discuss what services are available or what services do they know of or are aware of. Um, and when you start to kind of explain a bit further, well, that one might be that or that. So it's kind of maybe kind of breaking it down. But I think that's certainly something we could, I think there's fear, an element of fear um, for approaching a lot of services because it's maybe geared towards more adult or there's also, I think, from our kind of understanding, there's a concern of will I be taken seriously? Um, how do I put across my fears um, or my concerns? That can, certainly around mental health. Um, we all talk about it. I think there's still a lot of work to be done around the stigma and the, the labelling and all the kind of the big barriers. But yeah, I think kind of taking a lot more into consideration of what what would they want it to be called or what would they, they see it to be in terms of accessing. Yeah. I was just picking up the point about access to mental health services, uh, just to, to flag that Healthcare Improvement Scotland has a mental health access improvement support team that's going to be doing some work that's got a specific aim of improving access to psychological therapies and also improving act access to CAM services to children and adolescent mental health services. So that works and it's relatively early stages. It's intended to be done through a sort of collaborative approach where we'll be bringing together teams from across Scotland uh, who'll be looking at identifying improvements, testing those improvements and then coming together to share learning. Um, and absolutely central to that work will be working with um, young people themselves and with organisations that represent their interests. So it's, it's still um, in its early days, but we hope that that will make a difference to outcomes for young people. That, that sounds very interesting. And, and is, it, is the plan that you will approach young people's organisations or is there a way in which young people and their organisations can approach you? I think that work's already commenced, so I think some young people's organisations are already involved, but I'm sure um, colleagues who are involved in, in that team would very much welcome any further interest if anyone else would like to be involved in that. Thank you very much. Amy? I might get in touch with you about that afterwards, thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, we were um, commissioned by the Scottish Government to engage with children and young people around the changing school nursing role. So the school nursing role is becoming more um, specialist and, and, and targeted. And so we spoke to quite a few children and young people in the target groups about the barriers to going to speak to school nurse. And I think the main one that came out of that was about relationships with adults and the need for a trusting relationship with somebody that you know and that without that you're unlikely to share personal experiences. I mean it makes a lot of sense when you say it like that but that means um, having a bit of consistency with professionals so that you build up that relationship over time. Um, there's also the ambiguous um, area of confidentiality as well and how that's explained to children and young people. Um, obviously there's always going to be some cases if there's child protection or if the child is at risk of harming themselves or somebody else where confidentiality has to be broken but um, how that is done, how that is explained to children and young people is really important as well if they're going to talk about very personal things. And then the third one that, that came out through that, that engagement was worries about the impact on their family. So some of the things that they were talking about, um, you know, issues about not having enough food at home, really fundamental stuff like that. They were worried if they talked to somebody about that, that that would reflect badly on their family. And that was another um, barrier to them. So um, the, the, the solution to that is obviously about building trusting, consistent relationships with adults and professionals. Thank you. Just to follow on from what Amy said there about 
the importance of relationships and trust in terms of accessing services. I think we would wholeheartedly agree with that. And that's, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work around access, specifically around mental health um, for children and young people. Um, and what we found is that, um, well, actually, I've got a quote here that I'll just read from you from, from one of the young people. Doctors ask for you to refer yourself for counselling, but you might not be in the right frame of mind, which I think is a really important thing to think about when we're thinking about the difference between an adult service and a young person service, because a lot of the young people that we work with who are some of the most vulnerable in our society are not in a place where they can access those kind of services, and at the minute, services are configured in a way that that is necessary. Um, and we would we would probably argue that there needs to be a shift in that in terms of um, specialist mental health services for young people. So. Okay. Kate, yes, please. Um, talking about a first port of call, so obviously for the whole population, we need to raise awareness of where people can go, whether it's specialised helplines for mental health or, you know, the difference between going to your GP and a &E, that applies to the whole population. But specifically tailoring that first port of call to young people, what do we need to do better? So is it improving the nurse service? What about um, people that are not wanting to access services through school? Um, is it improving the way that we um, enable young people to have a first port of call? Or is it the information around what that first port of call is? Who would like to go at that one? That access to information question. Amy. I think there's a lot that could be done with primary care around engagement with children and young people. Um, I mean, and there are there are examples of, of good practice where there are young people's clinics, for example. Um, so that within a practice will have a, a, a designated young person's GP or nurse that has a bit of knowledge about how to speak to young people in an accessible way. Um, and that there are clinics where you can drop in and you know that you're not going to have to run the gauntlet of the, the receptionist, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are things that can be done to just make GP practices a lot more feel familiar and safe. But yeah, absolutely, the point about schools not necessarily always being the most appropriate thing is, is absolutely key. And certainly within the school nurses review, they're looking at holding um, drop-in centres in, in community centres um, that are, you know, where youth agencies are as well, so that so that you're, you're going to where the children and young people are rather than expecting them to come to you all of the time. And I think that would help a lot with access. Alice. Yeah, I think directly sort of following up from that, um, what young people are wanting, they're not wanting to go somewhere that's scary. They're wanting you know, early intervention support that's just maybe a drop-in or peer support, something that they don't get scared about, they feel comfortable, they feel like they can genuinely talk to somebody and not have to go through this like medical clinical process that's really scary for many young people. And um, part of the policy that SYP has is that there should be proportionate funding for particularly mental health services at all levels and not just the really sort of high, high up sort of um, services provided. It's the early intervention that I think needs to be looked at more in terms of, you know, it's just peer support, drop in, something so casual that can prevent uh, something so dangerous for a young person. Emma. Just a quick supplementary about access to school nurses. Are they on site? Are they somewhere else? Is it a drop in? Is it is it more community engagement? Is it face to face? How does a young person get to a school nurse? Just from personal experience, I couldn't tell you my school nurse. I couldn't tell you where I'd go at school if I mm -hmm. wanted to speak to a school nurse. I don't know who it is. I don't know where they are. Um, and I'm sure that goes for many young people as well. But from personally, I don't I don't know. By telling in itself, so good question, good question. Okay, can we move on a little bit further again? Um, one of the issues that came up when we were talking to young people in our various visits was around uh, health and, and, and diet and obesity, and I wonder if Ivan would like to start us off on that question. Thanks, um, thanks, convener. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, the evidence we took from the young people themselves w w was quite interesting because it very much chimed with what we think this, the, the, the issues in, around diet and obesity are. Um, and the, the, the young people seemed very knowledgeable about health eating, they need to have a balanced diet. And the suggestions they made were very much the things that, um, that they will all think need to be done. Healthy cooking lessons, importance of nutritious school meals, etc. <clears throat> Clearly this is a, a, a huge and, and um, potentially very damaging trend amongst young people in terms of poor diet and, uh, and growing obesity. 
I just wonder if the panel would like to reflect on that. Any thoughts you've got on how we take that forward, um, what the kind of issues we need to be addressing in government are, and where we go to try and make some inroads into this, uh, this particular aspect of young people's health. Okay. Um, anyone like to um, uh, can start with Amy? Thank you. Um, we've fairly recently um, submitted our response to the consultation on the obesity um, strategy, and I know that um, Scottish Youth Parliament and I think Young Scott have already done some engagement work with children and young people um, to inform that. So that would be really interesting to see what that says. Um, we know that 28% of children are currently overweight or obese, so it is a, it is a big issue for, for us. And, and, and some of our um, recommendations really recognise um, the social determinants, I suppose, of obesity and recognising that poverty is such a huge factor in this and that really we're not going to do anything about obesity if we don't address child poverty. Um, so making the connections between the two will, and, and obviously we have the Child Poverty Act now, so hopefully that will 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 um, will help. There are also another a number of other more uh, specific um, recommendations that we made around um, limiting price promotions on on unhealthy foods. Um, co-production of school meals with children and young people to encourage take-up because we know particularly for secondary school age children that there are much more appealing options quite often than staying in school for a school meal. So what can be done to encourage children and young people to stay in school and what are the healthy offers that they're going to take up? Um, restrictions on advertising of unhealthy foods and clear and uh, more consistent food labelling. There's also the um, area of... Um, cooking literacy I suppose um, how children and young people know about food how families know about food and how about families know about cooking um, one of our projects at the moment is Food Families Futures which is about opening up schools during the holidays with an emphasis on cooking um, which has been really positive um, working in a number of local authority areas, Glasgow, Renfrewshire um, Ayrshire um, but one of the challenges um, to that has been getting access to school kitchens um, because of the contracts in, in uh, local authority areas, uh, they've had to be negotiated and um, we've had to pay cleaning fees, um, all sorts of barriers that stop these fantastic community resources being used. Um, so that, I would say, is one of the specific challenges that we've come up against. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else on that front? Uh, yes, Nikki. Just to add that... Um, some of our family support work um, focuses on um, what Amy said there about sort of cooking literacy. So um, a lot of our work around schools and attainment will work in the school and will also work in the home with the family and the young person. And quite a lot of that is around helping um, that family around diet and routine and all of those kind of um, basics. And that's a really important element of kind of the family support work that we do um, in terms of diet as well. Thank you very much. Um, excellent. One of the other issues that came up or was sleep, which is uh, not so often discussed in parliamentary committees, but clearly an important issue, uh, an important issue for young people. Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, thank you, convener. So um, we're informed in our, our briefing that the Mental Health Foundation have noted that sleep deprivation is a seriously neglected issue um, in our population. Uh, teachers have have commented on sleep, the fact that you know often they're finding pupils who are are very tired that may be connected to to nighttime use of social media that's something we'll come on to um, and research in the papers we have today estimates that between 44 and 83 percent of children with additional support needs suffer from sleep problems and I'd just like to to hear from from the witnesses today if you think enough focus is placed on sleep in our national and local policies because you know there's evidence suggesting I'm actually reading a book at the moment called why we sleep by a sleep scientist Matthew Walker um, and he's saying that sleep has as big an impact on our health as as diet and exercise but we don't talk about it very much so just wondering if you think the focus is right is it there at all that's a, 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 an interesting one is there is there is it one that has come to the attention of the youth parliament or any of the other bodies that have looked at these issues um i don't have really anything um that the scottish youth part of have been saying but personally um I feel like there's a big, everyone knows as a young person that we're told, oh, you've got to have seven to eight hours sleep, uh, this and that, but 
no one's getting that. No one's doing anything about it. No one's, um, and I think what you're saying about nighttime use of social media, I'd agree that um, a lot of young people do use social media at nighttime, which, uh, you know, staying up later, not getting to sleep kind of thing. But also it's about when you come home, you've got homework, you've got work potentially, you've got, um, you know, extracurriculars, and then you've got to get up at seven, eight o'clock in the morning the next day. People don't have time to fit all of it in, and uh, it's not just about um, getting distracted on your phone, it's about all the extra things that you're doing. That means that you're not getting enough sleep, not getting enough free time, not getting enough social time. And it's just, that's literally it. Nikki. I would just, I think it's a really good point to bring up, and I'd probably say, no, it's not talked about enough in terms of mental health because we know that there are a lot of different determinants of mental health and sleep is obviously a really big part of that. And uh, as I said before, in terms of our family support work, when we support a family, a lot of it is around routine and that's diet and that's sleep because sometimes there'll be a, a child in a school who has um, particular issues and what you find out when you go home is that it is around sleep and it is around diet and it's about what's happening in that family environment rather than it just necessarily being an individualised problem with that young person. So I think, it's, I think it's a really important point and I don't think it's um, probably talked about enough in terms of mental health, the, the kind of importance of sleep and that's a good book as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amy. Agreed. I think it's a really important topic. Um, I can't. I'm apologies. I can't remember the the source of this, but I know it has been written about in terms of residential care. How sleep can be a particularly difficult issue if you're in residential care when there's noise, when you are told when the lights are going out, and that might not suit you. Um, and and you, you're just having to work around other people's patterns rather than your own. Um, so um, I think there's, there are some specifics there. Um, there's also um, the increasing understanding of the adolescent brain, which is, is relevant to this, and the fact that actually there's, there's increasing suggestion that the way we set up society doesn't really suit that, particularly with schooling. And I know there are some pilots about starting high school at a, at a later time that will actually enable young people to be there um, and actually more able to engage and learn in a way that, that suits their growing and developing brains. So um, I think if we're really serious about this, we probably have to consider some quite radical um, adjustments to how we, we set up schooling and education. Thank you. Denisha, is there anything from the point of view of care experienced young people that's worth adding on, on that issue of sleep? Yeah, I just think what Alison's saying is completely right. It's not talked about about sleep, and sleep does affect everything you do. You can't get up in the morning and function if you don't have enough sleep, and I feel for care experienced people, the last thing they care about is sleep. That's the last thing. They care about surviving and getting through the day. And if they've got to go to school or whatever it may be, can, like tired and not being able to function, they don't care about that. All they care about is how they're going to survive in the day. And I think it is something we need to look at closely and figure out where the problems are and how we can address that. Thank you very much. We've talked about social media and I think Emma has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, just before I ask my question about social media, I am interested in the diet and obesity that was talked about because there are apps on phones that will take a photograph of your food and they're being used for type 1 and type 2 diabetics so that you can tell how many carbs are in your plate. I'm just wondering, that might be a response that you could uh, make um, following my question. but. So regarding social media, some studies have identified that moderate use of social media is beneficial, but there are risks obviously involved for teenagers with the online cyberbullying and sharing of personal or private information and even access to harmful content. So one of the studies I was reading said that more than a third of 15-year-olds in the UK are extreme internet users, spending more than six hours online a day. That might contribute to the lack of sleep as well. So. There's obviously issues around internet, so I'm wondering um, if you've got any ideas what can be done to support kids and develop further resilience when they're online and uh, anything else that we should be worried about regarding uh, social media. Maggie? Um, I think the, the social media internet kind of debate is, is an interesting one. I think there's research on both sides and it's still relatively unclear about what that impact really is. Um, I think for us, from a Bernardo's perspective, it's around the relationships that can be potentially damaged by 
more sort of severe internet usage and, and lack of kind of face-to-face -face interactions with families and with peers and with, with that kind of... Um, and I, I mean, in, in terms of internet, I think what we've said is that it's really important that adults are aware of how to deal with these kind of issues, because I think too often there's that kind of, oh no, the children are using the internet, we all have to kind of shut it down, or, you know, that sort of censorship. And I think it's a really useful tool for a lot of things. So I think there's kind of an, a more nuanced debate about the sort of dangers and, and benefits of, use, of sort of internet usage that I think probably needs to be had in terms of that, from my perspective. Thank you very much. Amy. Um, I totally agree, and that uh, it's it, it's a it's a fact of life, and and we can't as adults be try to shut it down or pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and we part of that is recognising both the positives and negatives of of social media and children and young people's lives. Um, and the positives um, include peer support, friendship, connections, um, particularly with reference to children and young people living in remote and rural communities or that have specific very rare conditions and don't meet other people with their conditions on a day-to-day -day basis, that the opportunity to, to meet and share online is, is, is invaluable. Um, um, and, and yes, but we have a duty to protect uh, protect children and young people from from the, the the risks associated with social media. There are a couple of um, organisations that do good work in this area. I Mind is is what is one in particular that's working around mental health and how young people engage with with um, digital media. Um, so I'd recommend you you look at them. They've produced little animations and gifs and all sorts of stuff to talk about this. So it's, and then there's also um, the Five Rights. Um, um, set of rights that, that, that organisations can, can sign up to, which has, you know, ensures that the work that we're doing as organisations supports young people to keep safe online. Um, I think it's Young Scot that, that, that managed that in, in Scotland, although it's a UK-wide initiative and children in Scotland have joined and I recommend looking at that about how children's rights can be upheld on, online. So there is, there is action going on and I think um, probably what, what, the, the most important thing for us is, is to just become aware of, aware of, aware of that and, and um, familiarise ourselves with how young people are using social media. Thank you very much. Anyone else on that? I mean, I, I, I clearly, it's it's an issue that will continue to be on the on the um, front pages, if you like. That social media is um, a very valuable tool, as you say, but also brings uh, some uh, serious risks as well. Uh, I wonder if we can move on to the wider issue of mental health and start with Miles, please. Thank you. No, and I just wanted to touch on social media because it's about a year and a half ago I hosted a conference with Twitter and a lot of organisations who are here today um, were represented at that and one of the, the key conclusion which Twitter actually took away from that was we need to make sure young people and actually some adults and probably politicians especially have downtime from social media um, because you can get too hung up on what's going on, especially looking at other people's lives on Twitter and, and Facebook. So I think um, that's a lesson for all of us, but something which I know Twitter are quite keen to, to take forward, which I don't think I've seen them do so far, but it's something we'll need to, to monitor. In, in terms of mental health, I wanted to touch upon a few areas because I know from the evidence we've taken, I would say it's the number one priority which was raised with us. And I wanted to go back to some of the points which um, both Nikki and Julia raised in terms of provision, um, because I know certainly in terms of um, colleges and universities and schools, um, young people we spoke to thought there wasn't the emphasis on them providing uh, accurate and you know services available um, within those uh, those settings around early intervention. So I wonder if any of the, the panel have any ideas around how that could be improved. We've heard drop in, um, but to try to move away from general practice being the first point of contact for early intervention. Okay, who would like to start on that on that one? First point of contact. Sandra, is it something that Health Improvement Scotland has taken an interest in? Um, I, I've done a small amount of work in, in this area, I guess, in terms of um, we did some work with um, St Andrews University, which um, was about working with them and working with some of their students to look at the what matters, the issues about 
what matters to students, what impacts on their health and wellbeing, um, and to get their views about how the um, support services might be improved. Um, and as I understand it, that's resulted in um, an ag a commitment from um, St Andrews University to take forward some of those improvements um, to have um, more kind of health and wellbeing events that they'll, they'll publicise through um, a calendar um, and, and also to for them to look at how do they more routinely engage with students so that they can make sure that they're meeting their needs. But that was that was just one small uh, bit of activity. But, but useful. Um, St Andrews was a good example because recently um, NHS Fife have removed out of our services at St Andrews. So in terms of students uh, seeking uh, medical support, that's that's been a massive issue. So I, th I think how you scope for especially large student populations was something we needed to look at. Nikki. Um, I think it's a really good point. Um, our, our work is, is less about sort of colleges and more about sort of provision in schools and we've been doing a lot of work around this and I think in terms of schools what we would say is it's really important to have uh, to be able to upskill the staff within that school to be able to respond um, to children young people experiencing what we'd probably call psychological distress rather than a mental health difficulty and I think that's the problem at the minute is that the issue with CAMS and the sort of waiting list and the backlog is because that is the default for schools and that's what we found is that referrals will often bounce between a school and a Bernardo service and CAMS and, and, and back and forth like that wondering where this kind of sits and that's that's part of the problem is, is because there isn't enough earlier intervention for those young people who might be at the sort of earlier stages of developing not a mental health disorder but needing some kind of support so um, what we would like to see is um, we were really welcomed the Scottish Government funding for trauma-informed uh, practice um, last week, which is absolutely incredible. Um, there's an a, a excellent resource from NHS Education Scotland and the Scottish Government around psychological trauma. Um, and if what we would like to see is the upskilling of, of professionals to be able to deal with those more low-level um, concerns before it reaches crisis point, I think. Thank you very much. Julie. What um, Nikki said, one of the services that we run um, through with Love Learning Scotland um, is a within school service where we um, the schools are identifying young people that are disengaged from education for whatever reason, but a lot of that is to do with um, the kind of dynamic, family dynamic, um, and mental health is, is prevalent throughout, um, whether it be the young person or family. Um, so, but Going on to what you were saying about the, the teaching and um, kind of upskilling of the, the professional staff and stuff uh, in terms of their understanding of and not to, to if you like, to hit that panic button that, you know, I, I don't know what's happening here, I don't know how to do so, I'll, I'll kind of outsource if you like. Um, our service has been really widely kind of greatly accepted, but the feedback from the teaching staff is that they are seeing that as another kind of stage rather than going from not to 60. Um, that there's the kind of intervention along the way um, that doesn't necessarily have to be straight to overloaded services already, such as CAMs and GP referrals. Um, so I think creating other avenues of support, whether it be through kind of third sector organisations, whatever that may be, but I think going from that, um, I don't know how to deal with this, to, to just having to outsource it, I think that's, that's a big key to it, is upskilling existing people who have those relationships with the young people, because these, the staff within the schools are spending time with the young people, are building that relationship, are getting to know them, so they've got that trust there. So if they had another piece of equipment in their tool bag to be able to support, you, you're kind of complementing an existing trust relationship. Yeah. Okay, Alice. Do something that the Health and Wellbeing Committee at the Scottish Parliament talk about a lot, mm -hmm. and we recently put forward and the motion passed that the Scottish Parliament believes that high quality, robust training on how to identify and support young people experiencing mental health difficulty should be a mandatory component of um, teacher training, and it's always talked about how useful it would be. And I know CME are doing a lot uh, right now. I think they're going around Scotland uh, teaching um, teachers how to um, deal with mental health. And as you're saying, um, Julie, it's so vital, just a first step that can just stop something. And if a teacher, as you know and trust, has that sort of support that they can give a young person, it would just be so beneficial to both the young person and the teacher, the teacher to see that they've done something as well. And it would just be great if teachers could have that sort of, um, as you say, tool, toolbox, a tool in their box, yeah. Amy. My 
colleagues at Youth Link Scotland would, would, are, are sitting on my shoulder going, saying, remember youth work in this at the moment. Um, and I think that's a really important part of the picture uh, as well in terms of uh, who are the children and young people in, in children's lives, young people's lives, and when they're out of school, particularly during the holidays, during the weekends, etc. A number of them are taking part in clubs and societies, and that is another really good opportunity to support young people in a group environment, in a you know in a non-stigmatising environment, in a in a with a skilled workforce, and the youth workforce is skilled, um, and in, in other countries I know they have youth workers in, in schools to do some of that level intervention, and and that's 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 available in every school in the Netherlands and Finland, um, and I certainly think um, things like uh, People Equity Fund offer opportunities to bring youth work agencies much closer into schools and build those relationships even further so um, yeah they're, they're part, definitely part of the picture as well. Thank you very much Miles and then Alex. John um, the mental health strategy a 10-year strategy the government published which takes us to 2027 uh, contained 40 specific actions um, which focused on children and young people I just wanted I, I know some of the organizations here were critical of that strategy in the beginning and um, whether or not you felt it was now fit for purpose. Amy? Um, in part, that's, that's a bit of a, a weak answer. Um, there's a lot of action in there. There's a lot of emphasis on children and young people. The gosh, there's about, what, 20 odd recommendations that relate specifically to children and young people, which is welcome. And that's, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, our criticism of it is it's, it's a bit pick and mix, so that there's a lot of different actions. What does it all add up to? The vision about what's going to dis what it's going to feel different in ten years' time isn't really evident. What's the ambition for children and young people's mental health isn't really spelled out. And we would also say it's too medical in its approach, so it's still a clinical intervention based. Um, rather than looking at the social determinants of, of, of mental health, um, so it doesn't cut across, it doesn't draw the connections with poverty, with discrimination, um, outside of mental health discrimination, um, enough for us. Um, but there, there, are, there are some good things in there. It's not like the, 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 you know, we welcome the emphasis on children and young people's mental health within it. And the other issue, Nikki? probably just to echo what Amy said in terms of we were quite critical of it at the at, when it was published um, there are some there are some points in there that have the potential to be really good there's the review of PSE there's the review of CAMS rejected referrals there's individual elements of that that should recommendations come out that actually lead to the kind of transformational change we want to see would be fantastic but I think the proof will be in the pudding for some of those things and I think just to echo that we were disappointed because of the the medicalised sort of um, the way the strategy was put together and didn't recognise that there are lots of other elements that, that contribute to children and young people's mental health. So um, still work to be done, I think, but definitely progress. Yeah. Thank you, Gideon. Um, just to start by echoing um, your point, Amy, on youth work, because a lot of young people who aren't necessarily engaged with formal education are probably more predisposed to having mental health issues. So that's absolutely where youth work reaches the parts that other uh, interventions can't. Um, about three weeks ago, Rob McCulloch Graham and Janice Hewitt, who are chief officers of two of Scotland's um, largest integrated joint boards, uh, health and social care partnerships, said on an unprompted basis that referrals to child and adolescent mental health services are increasing in their words, at a terrifying rate, and there is something we are not doing right in terms of that unmet need. Um, it strikes me that part of the problem is that we have got very good at encouraging not just young people, everyone, to start talking about their mental health and to start thinking about their mental health and understanding when they might need a problem or those around them can understand if they, they need help. But we aren't getting them to the races um, for months, if not years, in terms of the amount of time it takes to see them. Um, is the answer to that, if they have to endure those weights, I don't think they should, I think we should have a, a massive transfer, transformational investment in CAMS, but if they, while we have these weights, what can we be doing for these young people in the services around them, um, whether that's trauma-informed approach from teachers or just managing their expectations as to when they can expect to be seen? Any views on that? Um, Nikki? Um, we've just yesterday published um, this report, which is to run alongside the um, the audit of, of CAMS rejected referrals, and, and almost everything you've said is, is kind of contained in that report. Our, our concern is 
um, is around the children, young people who are not getting access and what happens to them whilst they're waiting. And I think, as I said before, lots of our young people themselves have said it's that being bounced between different services that is part of the problem. And whether that wait is a month or a year or two years, it's the, it's the not knowing what's happening, which is, which is really difficult. Port Nagy. Um, it's it's order of rejected referrals to child and adolescent mental health services. Um, it's um, it's from our staff, so I can give you the Excellent. bit already. Thank, thank you very much. Excellent, uh, Emma. I think you had a brief question as well. Brief question. I think it's just your opinion. Last week, he announced 1.35 million to go towards national trauma training for people, adults, and children who are experiencing adverse childhood well, events or adverse childhood experiences. So, um, and that is to target a national training programme. So what's your thoughts on that news that was announced uh, just last week? Hugely welcomed it. It's something that we've been wanting to see for a long time. As I say, the the training, the trauma training framework itself is an absolutely fantastic document. Um, so to see the resource put behind it is extremely welcome. Um, and the, as we understand it, the intention behind it is for it to span across not just targeted services who work directly with people who've experienced trauma, but a universal approach as well. So that, as everyone has said, you know, we can start to pick up some of these issues much earlier. So fantastic. A brief question from Alex Gilhamilton. So, thank you, convener. It was just to, as a corollary to my first question. It's about um, when young people are waiting so long that they stop being young people and become adults. Um, transitions to adult services across service provision, not just mental health, um, is patchy or sketchy at best. Um, how do we? Are panel members aware of any examples of good practice where that transition is seamless and young people don't? suffer a dip in provision when they turn 18. Okay, thank you. Any, any, any examples of good transition? Amy. Um, that, that's where um, provision has been extended up to the age of 26. Um, and there has been some work in, in England around that um, and Northern Ireland around um, extending CAMS up to 26. And I know that's something that Sam H are calling for currently. Um, we would support that. That, that really helps. Um, it's such a jump between, um, and that's not just related to uh, mental health either. I think that would probably go for all health services. Is is the transition from child and adolescent to to adult services is 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 difficult and not always well managed, um, and the, the good practice would come down to planning. Um, years in advance, um, looking through options, the good practice would come to how you make adult services more accessible for young adults. Um, and that, that, that takes specialist tailored approaches um, that are, that are recognise the specific needs of that community. Um, I can't, th that's not to say they don't exist, but I can't think of any good examples in Scotland at the moment, but there may well be. Okay, I think that's quite telling in itself. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything on that on that front. If not, we'll move on to uh, one of the areas that struck me when we were talking to young people as young as uh, primary seven was uh, uh, the connection that they saw between physical activity and mental health. And I, I was very struck by that in, in, in talking to young people. I wonder if Brian Whittle would like to start to question um, that. Thank you, convener. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an area that, uh, as you know, I'm particularly interested in is around uh, physical activity, nutrition uh, and, uh, and inclusivity. And, and before I get to the primary school uh, examples, um, we also had, the, Sandra White and I also had the opportunity to, um, uh, afforded to us by Cardinal College to speak to probably uh, slightly, slightly older uh, uh, college students who all who had significant uh, mental health issues and can I put it on record my thanks to Cardinal College and to all the students there who I thought were quite remarkable uh, and, and very open in the way they spoke but what stri strikes me is they are absolutely aware they absolutely understand the importance of being physically active they absolutely understand the importance of good nutrition yet they still don't do it and a lot of that came around, you know, going to there was, there was a, a Apache uh, sort of evidence around going to your GP and the GP saying, yeah, what you need to do is go and get, go and join the gym. You know, that that kind of access to uh, a, a, a much better intervention. So I think around there, I, I'm really interested in how we how we link up uh, physical activity with good mental health in terms of physical education in schools, and and what do we do to promote 
or, or further promote the benefits of being physically active and, and good nutrition to our mental health uh, within our young people. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think just sitting listening to probably the last three questions that have been posed around health, diet, mental health, all of that around, we know that physical activity, activity can have a positive impact um, on not just young people, but everyone's lives across all of these areas. Um, I think, as Brian said, they ab everybody absolutely knows that it's good um, and that you should be doing it. And it's just then that lack of taking that next step and, you know, making it happen. Um, and I, I think it's very telling that um, within the school system and the education system, we definitely need to look at that PE provision. So we know at the moment it's statutory for two hours um, or two periods of physical education so that every child's got um, access to that. Is that enough? Is that going far enough around this area? Um, do we need to do more? And is... PE as it's currently delivered and seen as that the right um, format because we know that there's a lot of children and young people that will be completely put, be put off of being physically active because of their school um, experience. So it's definitely around um, that wider engagement of the school day. How can we encourage then um, that understanding of being physically active and extracurricular um, and make these the connections, um, I guess, for want of a better word. And I think with all of these issues, it's really um, key that partners are working together and we're pulling together the resources. It's not down to one organisation, one field. It's not down to one institution. It's around combining the expertise knowledge so that we're actually all working together to you know, challenge some of that and make it happen rather than everyone just knowing it's a good thing but then not actually doing it. And does Sports Scotland have a particular role in enabling that to happen? Is, is there a specific... Uh, agreement, if you like, that you're pursuing uh, to uh, achieve that kind of partnership approach? Absolutely. So, you know, we're working very closely with um, local authority um, partners, government bodies, um, and I think we probably could do more just around that health agenda as well. So I think there's definitely areas where we can improve. Um, but steps in the right direction, I think, is just trying to make these connections and um, work better together so that we are providing that opportunity for every child. Okay, thank you very much. Any other witnesses have thoughts to that? Uh, Brian. Um, just just on, the, on the back of that, the, the actual um, uh, young people in, the, in that uh, session came up with their own, a lot of really good ideas themselves, uh, which was quite interesting. I thought they'd never been in that environment when they all sat around the table before and um, they came up with their own solutions around buddying systems, around creating opportunities to be active within that uh, their, 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 peer, their peer group, which they felt was less threatening. So I thought it was quite interesting. But to go back to your original thought there, we, the, the other school that we did was around with primary fives. <coughs> and again, they're very, very knowledgeable about the impact of, of, of wanting to be physically active. I mean, that we've got them at an age where they actually want to be physically active. We, they understand completely the importance of nutrition. And yet the feedback we were getting from them were they weren't getting access to that. We had you know, a young girl who wanted to play basketball uh, but couldn't get to the basketball net in the, um, in the playground because of the boys. And we had a young lad wanting to play baseball. So the, the, there was this idea that they, they really want to be active but they're not getting that access to the opportunity. So I guess my question would be around the link between school physical activity and extracurricular activity, are we are we getting that right? Is there, is there more we can do around that, that environment? Amy? Um, it's quite telling that there's been a couple of examples of um, girls having barriers to sports. Um, and I think that's one of the things that statistics and evidence can show us, that, that particularly as girls hit teenage years, that they, they drop off in terms of their physical activity. And we need to understand why that is um, and certainly there's something about why does sport become less accessible is it because there's fewer opportunities for girls, is it because it's unappealing for other reasons more sort of cultural self esteem body image reasons, it's probably it's very complex, there's probably a few things and, and more broadly for all um, children and young people, what, what are the other social barriers um, to participating in sports and we've talked about um, some of those earlier um, in terms of Money, equipment, 
um, kit, gear, um, travel, what have you, and 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 certainly um, um, those are those are those are real barriers, particularly if you're living in an area of of, of poverty and deprivation. Um, I'll, I'll just take this opportunity to flag up what uh, Finland's response to this is: is the they have brought in a um, a hobby guarantee so that every child and young person uh, will have access to one extracurricular hobby. Now that's not necessarily sport, they've chosen to extend it, to include it, to be cultural arts um, hobbies as well, but that's their recognition that those extracurricular opportunities to take part in creativity or to take part in exercise are absolutely vital and that we have a duty to overcome the barriers at a, sort of, at a societal level. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, Alice or Denisha, I know you've both commented in, in, uh, already on some of these issues. Are there aspects of this that you think need a bit more uh, attention? Uh, yeah. Well, just on what was the point made by Amy, uh, the barriers towards sport. Speaking to our members, overwhelmingly, there's so many barriers. Um, research from the University of Leeds 2014 suggests that participation in sport is actually highest for young people in residential care but in kinship and foster care it kind of just falls. So that's another kind of barrier, even though they already have the barriers in residential care, so what I mentioned before with the institutional barriers, they're still getting more access than those in kinship and foster care. Um, and I think an important point would be to kind of raise is that if we look around at like national heroes in terms of sport, like Sir Chris Hoy, mm -hmm. would he have won the same amount of gold medals if he was from a care background? The barriers that are faced on young people in care do hinder their lives, and it's not an understatement to say about the social capital of a sport. You gain friends through that. You see, like, get a sense of accomplishment. You feel like you belong somewhere. And kids are too often facing barriers that are hindering them and potentially stopping them from being the next circus hoy. Yeah, I just completely agree with everything you're just saying. Like, and cost. It all comes back to cost as well. Uh, just. People can't afford to pay five pounds every time they want to go to the gym. If all their friends are going to the gym, that's where they want to go as well. And it's just, yeah, it's. Thank you very much, Elsa. I want yes, please. Um, so just picking up on um, the point of girls' um, involvement in physical activity and sports, that's an area that uh, we've done quite a lot of work, um, certainly within the school setting, um, around girls barriers to participation so and we know there's a lot of evidence that exists and, and I think there's um if you take evidence from around the globe uh, definitely down south in Scotland it's the same issues across all of them in terms of what we need to tackle and it's when we hit you know the teenage years that we can see um the certain issues where girls start to drop out and you know that's um, been a trend that's been there for a number of years now um there's some really positive programmes out there that we're trying to um, work with um, schools on to change that trend. Um, we've developed a, a solutions workshop that's really around educating the workforce. Um, so we're targeting more the people who are involved with working with um, girls and young women um, in terms of their understanding. And it really comes down overwhelmingly, the feedback from young people and from the girls themselves, um, is that need for consultation and to just be asked and spoken to around what they want to um, be part of and take part of uh, within that both school and extracurricular um, setting. So that's something that we're very passionate about and uh, definitely want to see um, that trend, trend changing. Um, I think really positively, the. Scottish Household Survey actually showed an upward trend in that in the last figures that were published um, to show that there had been a rise since um, 2008 in the figures um, coming out of that of actually more girls um, being physically active. But that is not to say that um, we realise that that's still a huge issue um, within both kind of school and extracurricular. So it's something that we'll continue um, to work with with our partners. And, and do Sports Scotland have any targets or objectives in, in these areas around uh, young people's participation, girls' participation in sport? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the corporate plan definitely sets out um, the fact that we've got a huge ambition um, to try and provide opportunities for children and young people within Scotland. And that's something that we're um, continuing to work on, you know, across all children and young people. Um, not just around the girls. So, yeah, it's definitely a focused area for us um, okay. to concentrate on. 
Thank you very much. Any other witnesses want to comment on that, or Brian, do you have? Um, I think that for me, uh, uh, the, the one question I would have was this: this idea of um, when you when in the school, the physical education, the tours of physical education, is, uh, you know, for me, is around this learning how and why to be uh, physically active. Um, what was coming back out of the, uh, out of the feedback was that then that application of that learning, the ability to apply that learning, um, either either in an extracurricular activity in school or in the community, uh, uh, was, ne was, was missing. Uh, is that an area we need to work harder on? I'm very cognizant of, of, of the cost of, of participation, which is why I'm so keen that uh, uh, physical, that, that, that uh, access to physical activity or sport or, or, or um, drama, art, music, whatever, remains at school at the end of the school day. So, so, so we take that out. So, are we are we missing a trick here? Are, are we missing that connection between physical education uh, and, and being able to apply that learning? Any thoughts, Elsa? Um, obviously have the active schools network um, in place which is a network of coordinators that have got access into every primary and secondary school within Scotland and their role is really to you know address that before during and after school um, slot to increase the links and to increase the connections um, within school participation and then that extracurricular um, participation and they provide links then out into community avenues as well so again you know i'll never say that we can't always do more and improve on this and get it better but there's certainly a network um, of coordinators out there who are providing that provision um, for every child within the school setting um, or at least providing that opportunity uh, should children wish to take it um, to come along and to take part in various activities um, and I think it's always unfortunate if there's an activity that you particularly want to play and pursue but it's not on your doorstep and that's something that uh, they're very aware of listening to the children and young people that they'll be working with to always try and um, have a look to see what they can do but it's definitely about bringing the local clubs and communities into that school environment and vice versa of taking the kids into extracurricular out with the school as well um, to try and um, provide these opportunities for them. Alice. I know from personal experience in my school we have something called school rugby which is run I think by our local rugby club that come to the school and anyone who wants to it can get out of like half a half a, like a period a week uh, to do rugby as well as doing your PE uh, which is a lot of people do it and it is a really good way to get people to do more exercise because also it's a wee bit of an incentive like oh I get to miss class <laughs> if I go to school rugby uh, but it should uh, I was speaking to someone the other day and um, just back to the whole girls thing there isn't a school rugby for girls it's just for boys because girls can't I don't know what it is but girls can't play rugby with boys or something um, I, I, know it's just, <laughs> I know it's just if that's at my school but and then it's a really good way to get people to into sport and if they had these sort of programs for not for other sport and in other schools I don't know if other schools do have uh, the likes of school of rugby it's a great great way c if you're wanting to do something addition additional to PE or um, something you do outside of school Thank you very much Emma just a quick sup again um, I think um, everybody's contributions have been great and we're talking about health and sport and uh, young women and getting them into sport but there's an LGBT group that might need access to health and well-being and sport as well so I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Amy? Yes, agreed <laughs> and that, that's another group that, that, that can experience barriers to sport in terms of um, um, not feeling welcome or not feeling able to participate. Um, so um, I, 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 I mean, it's a shame there's not a group around the table that represents LGBT um, children, young people. Though we all, we all, we all speak on their behalf as well as part of our jobs. Um, so yes, we'd would agree with that. Um, and um, I know there are a number of local societies, sports societies, football clubs, etc., that exist for adults, but I don't know the extent to which they exist for children and young people. So. Okay, that's a very important question. Mm -hmm. uh, Miles. Thanks, yeah, I just wanted to come on that point because, um, you know, we keep hearing about cross-portfolio working needed. People need to get out of their silos to make things happen for young people. Um, here in the city of Edinburgh, for example, the council has a um, top priority to have more opportunities for young people. And this week are likely to then... Uh, 
vote towards increasing charges for uh, sports clubs to be able to use facilities in the city. And a lot of these clubs are contacting me saying we're likely to fold or not actually put on as many. So do you have any examples of where that's actually happening in practice, which best practice could be spread so that we could actually make more happen for young people in Scotland, more opportunities, and where you think we're not actually delivering at the minute on that? It's a very, a very broad question, but again, examples of what works, I guess, is what we're looking for in terms of uh, pr promoting, promoting that more widely. <laughs> well, it's uh, come to come to something when questions are being answered by members of the committee, but we can <laughs> we can we can do that once in a while. Brian, <laughs> sorry, uh, I just happen to be in this environment. Um, there are some. There are councils out here that are doing some really, really great work where they are giving access to those groups who are, are most vulnerable. I've already heard of, of, of access for carers. We've got LGBTI. We've got access around um, a youth as well. Where and I know that um, East Ayrshire are very good at that. Are very good at encouraging um, uh, those groups into into sport. And I think that's what that tells me is it, it, it can be done. And I think that that's what it tells me. It can be done. So that kind of practice, what I would like to understand how they're managing to do that and how we can then spread that out to the rest, the rest of the country. My own question as well. Um, I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've recently visited the yard uh, here in Edinburgh, which is a disabled uh, children's play space. Now, they have a fantastic facility, but also have a waiting list of, I think they said 200 parents to me. That might not be the correct figure. Um, just up the road from them is a school they could be using. They would kit out, they would put volunteers in. But we're fighting a way to get Edinburgh City Council to let the janitors keep that facility open. Now, simple things like that, and we've raised this as a committee in terms of work we've done around access to sport, is something I think as a country is holding us back. And so I just thought, is there any examples you know of where we've just been able to cut through what sometimes seems to just be bureaucracy we're putting in place uh, to make things happen? Thank you for that, and, and, and there'll be an opportunity to answer that in just a second. But we, we've heard we've heard uh, a lot from committee members in the last few moments. So I want to, starting with Amy, because I know she wants to address that question, but I want to ask all the witnesses who are not members of the committee, um, having heard the various uh, uh, issues that we've addressed this morning, uh, in, as, a, as a last round of the table, is there any issue uh, relating to young people, health, uh, care and sport? which we haven't covered this morning, which you're very keen that we should uh, address, but also any answers to those last comments. Amy. Um, I, I, it made me think of, actually, well, this is a Year of Young People um, roundtable, and, and we have a fantastic 500 Year of Young People ambassadors that are um, uh, exist to, su to support the year and, and, and at the, the cross-party group um, for children and young people, Year of Young People special meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago we heard from um, one called Rhys McCall who is a boxer and has uh, six disabilities and that's another group that we have to recognise that there are barriers to participation in, in, in sports and um, physical activity as well as if you've got um, disabilities. Um, and he wasn't allowed to box to start with because of his disabilities and um, he, he is now a boxer and the, he's got over through those barriers through sheer um, willpower, I would say, his own determination to, to um, change people's minds, um, to uh, break down some of the, the barriers and um, he's, a, he's a fantastic example um, of, of, of what can be done when you're motivated enough but it does seem disappointing that, that that's what it's taken, it's taken him um, to, to, to remove those barriers rather than um, organisations around him um, recognising that they need to move to, to, to shift things. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. That's a, a strong example uh, towards the end of our evidence. Is there anything else from witnesses uh, that you think we haven't covered or, or, and that you really want to make sure we get on the record um, uh, before we finish this question session? Uh, yes, Denisha would like to highlight the point that I feel in relation to sport and discrimination and care, that the system, the dark reality is that the system built around loss and not love. So to take something in sport and in school, like sports day, it's where your whole school unite. And for me, it was, we were split into different houses, your whole house got together, it was a very active thing. But I would just like to draw the attention of the committee to think about care experience people. When you're running to that finishing line and you look up, 
and you see everyone else's parents cheering you on and your parents aren't there. I think it is important that we need to start making this care system about love and listening to young care experienced people and their barriers and make a serious change because they just feel so left out. Thank you very much for that. That's very powerful evidence. Any other uh, final comments? Alice. Uh, part of the SYP's campaign right here, right now, um, our national campaign, is focusing on incorporating the UNCRC into Scots law. And it would be great if that could uh, happen, because then that would mean that the rights to play, etc., would be um, binding and not guiding in the Scots law. Thank you very much. And um, Nikki. Just in terms of mental health, just what I would like to leave the committee with is in terms of the systems that we have at the minute, what we would like to see is a model of support based on relationships and rooted in children and young people's experiences and not the symptoms that they're displaying in terms of their mental health. Thank you very much. And can I thank all of the witnesses for a, a very stimulating and interesting uh, evidence session, uh, which gives us a great deal of food for thought. Uh, we will now uh, suspend for five minutes and thereafter we will go to private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>